Well, good afternoon, everyone and colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be here for the first time uh, as a PAGE member. I've been coming to uh, spring meetings for a couple of years, and they finally let me in on what they're calling a body of work exemption, which I think is a polite way of saying I'm an old guy, and maybe we ought to just let him in before he goes. Um, but to be serious, I, I really want to thank uh, Dave and Amer, um, in particular for their assistance, and most importantly, Ann McCarthy, who many of you know, uh, who really worked hard to make sure that I got in to be a member, and I'm grateful to all of them uh, to be up here on stage with you uh, today. Uh, in this morning's breakfast meeting for new members, uh, Roger Bolton said, look, the most important thing to do as a new member is to raise your hand and get involved. So I made the decision to do that when I heard they were going to do a, a, a spring event on activism. So I know a little something about that, having come from the crazy crisis world of HP. Um, and what happens when you raise your hand is you get sucked in. So Andy said, OK, there's a victim. Bill, um, put a panel together for us and get going. And suddenly I was on the spring committee meeting. So my encouragement to my fellow new members is do exactly what I did. Raise your hand. You're going to get sucked into a great organization, having been here for more than a few years uh, as, as a, uh, a guest. You're in good company. Uh, today's topic is one which I know strikes at the, the, the hearts and fears of a lot of corporate communicators. What do you do if you suddenly get involved with a shareholder activist? That doesn't necessarily, as you're going to hear from the panel, have to be a negative experience. Um, but just reading this morning that BP's uh, CEO had his salary cut by $8 million because of an activist, I can tell you it's still very much in the news. Now, Brunswick recently completed a global M&A study. I think this is the 10th year in a row that they've done that. And the study found that participants or respondents felt almost by nearly 60% that we've moved to a period of real crisis with activists to one of constructive engagement, which sounds like a State Department expression. So I want to play that out with our panel. So I'd like to invite the panel to come on up. You've all had a chance to read their bios. Uh, but I'd like to welcome uh, David Bonoy, who's the activism reporter for The Wall Street Journal, Mike Miller, the former general counsel of Monster.com, Steve Velosky, who represents uh, Olshan, the largest firm that uh, supports uh, activists, and finally, Barrett Golden, who's a partner with Joel Frank, uh, one of our industry's better crisis and financial uh, crisis firm. So welcome to the panel. Thank you for coming. So as a longtime corporate communicator, I love to be in a position to ask a Wall Street Journal reporter a question. <laughs> so wouldn't all of you. Um, so let me start with you, David. So the, the Brunswick study suggested we move from a period in which uh, activists were really up in the face of corporations, sometimes by surprise creating an enormous opportunity for the journal to sell an awful lot of newspapers and, and web time. Do you agree that we've moved to a period of more constructive engagement? And what's your perspective from your beat position? So uh, I think we definitely have in some cases, right? I think Barrett might answer differently than Steve would answer the question. But um, from, from our perspective, where I see kind of across the, the spectrum of activism, there certainly is a lot more engagement you see even people like Carl Icahn are willing to sort of come in and, and talk to the board a little bit more and not just fire off angry tweets and letters. Um, but that said, there's still an awful lot of angry tweets and letters, um, especially kind of uh, on the smaller side of activism. New firms, you might see it a little bit more. Uh, things still can get very heated. And even if they try to be constructive at the beginning, I'm sure most CEOs don't really love someone coming in and saying, essentially, you're not doing a great job, which is the underlying message for every single activism who shows up. So Steve, I, let, let me move on to you. I, I, first of all, do you agree with what David had to say? And can you, uh, given that you advise an awful lot of activist firms, can you characterize the difference between the long-term large entrenched players and the up-and-comers? Do you see a difference in the way they behave with boards and companies? Yeah, there's a, there's a huge difference between the I guess the 10, 12 large activists out there that have, that have been around for a while and they're sort of household names and they surface and um, the first communication is not with the chief communications officer, usually with the CEO or you know, the, the chairman of the board or lead independent director. With some of the smaller activists there and some of them that are just starting out, they're not, they're not household names, they're dealing with smaller companies and uh, in those cases, the communications may be 
um, a little more public for those trying to make a name. Uh, for others, it is really behind the scenes because they've broken off from other firms. Uh, but I think that the, the biggest change that I see is that um, activism as a tool, which is really communications with the company, is really accepted across the board. So you have what are called reluctant activists. You have long-only uh, hedge funds that would never have thought five years ago about you know, sending a letter to a board and raising issues. Now it's, it's acceptable to do that. So it really is across the board. It's not just the household names, but I would say last year, 25% of the situations we did were for what we call reluctant activists whose fund size were over $5 billion. Barrett, your firm uh, serves many of the companies even sitting in this room to provide advice and counsel when the phone rings, when the letter arrives, when the press release shows up on the wire. Are you finding corporations more prepared today than they've been in the past for this? Uh, what's your sense about people's readiness for activism? Uh, yes, companies are preparing well before the letter comes. So it used to be that we were engaged right around proxy season uh, to help get out the vote and sway it, sway it towards the companies. Uh, more companies now are engaging not just communications firms, but banks, law firms, proxy solicitors, others to come in and help them evaluate the landscape um, so they can take issues off the table proactively, ideally before an activist ever comes on the scenes. Um, a large part of our work is working with companies to communicate with their stakeholder base internally and externally. So there is alignment and understanding around their goals and objectives. And, and ideally, if you do that well, uh, there won't be a place for an activist. I want to I want to come back to that topic because I think that's a really important one. But one of the companies that had an activist say management wasn't doing its job was Monster. And Mike, you were there as the general counsel, as you were describing to me yesterday in a phone call, in the midst of the final stages of pretty significant transaction and completely out of the blue, um, you had a bit of a disruption. Tell us in, in a couple of minutes what you experienced. Sure, thanks, Bill. So I agree with everything that Barrett just said. Um, at Monster, as in many other C-suites, we've been conditioned to embrace activism, that, that it could be constructive. And we, we've been prepared, and we've been ready, and we've had Joelle Frank by our side. Um, we've engaged, we, the past year, two years, we haven't done so well on, or the past 2014 and 15, we didn't do so well on say on pay. Um, so I really built a shareholder engagement effort with the CEO and the, and the chairman of the comp committee to really reach out to all of our, our main shareholders. And so I spent two years doing that. We succeeded in 2016. Um, we really thought we had a great handle on who our share, shareholders were, how they felt. Um, the spring of 2016, there was uh, all of a sudden a resurgence of interest in Monster from potential acquirers. Uh, we had undergone a strategic alternatives process in 2012 that was not, uh, did not result in a strategic uh, transaction. Uh, what it did result in was a new strategy for Monster. Um, as I said, spring 2016, we start getting inbounds. Um, there's a lot of private equity interest, and then there were a couple of strategic acquirers. And over the, over the summer, we ended up negotiating with Ronstadt. Uh, we did not conduct another strategic process. We felt that that would be damaging to the business. Um, and we felt that Ronstadt really was the only real offer out there. Uh, we negotiated the transaction. Ronstadt chose to do a tender offer for the shares. And we uh, executed the agreement and announced it in early August. I went on vacation <laughs> for a week tried to get out for a week. And I remember getting a call on Friday morning, uh, uh, the 16th of August, I believe. Did you, did you, did you see the, the, the press release? I said, what, what are you talking about? And it was a all out attack on the competence of management, the deal, the competence of the board um, by a company called Media News Group. And nobody knew who Media News Group was other than they're a big customer of Monster. So why would a customer of Monster be 
you know, launching an attack on a transaction, um, and why is it coming this way? Uh, it, chaos ensues. Um, it turns out that Media News Group is major a majority owned by um, Alden, a activist hedge fund, and many of the executives at Media News came come out of the Alden world. So Media News is essentially a sheep in wolf's clothing. Um, under the, under the guise of having experience in the jobs business because they're a customer of Monster and they know how, their, their thesis was they know how to do it better. Um, they didn't really get into the thesis in the first letter. They just said, reject, reject this transaction, we'll come back to you. Um, they didn't come back with a plan until mid-September, about a week before the initial offer period was set to expire. And it was a 100-page deck of what they would do differently. Um, in addition, they were proposing to remove the entire board, um, should Monster remain public. Um, they then subsequently launched a partial tender offer for 10% uh, uh, of the shares outstanding at a price that was 30 cents higher than the price that Ronstadt was paying for the entire company. So, in our mind, it was just an attempt to um, create confusion in the market. Um, we were, as management and the board, completely taken aback and caught off guard. Uh, not because we weren't prepared for, you know, as I said, discussions with activists, but coming, you know, the way that this came at us through an entity that was not on our radar screens, was not had not reached out to us. You know, I remember going to the sales, the head of sales saying, did Media News ever, in your conversations or your field sales conversations with them, raise any issues with Monster? And it just, it came out of the blue. Well, I suspect that there are a lot of people in this room that, that fear going away on vacation for just that reason. Yeah. <laughs> I, which is why some of us don't ever go on vacation. Well, it's, it's vacation in quotes. <laughs> yeah, in quotes. Uh, so. I want to pick up on that story because there's a lot of lessons in it, but David, from where you sit, obviously there is the juiciness of the unexpected salvo in the middle, but as a reporter who covers this beat regularly, what's your mindset going into it? Because I'd have to imagine at some level the unexpected surprise has you wondering, why are they taking this method to be disruptive, and does that go into your calculus and how you cover the story? Yeah, sure. Um, we certainly... Uh Listen, my job is to ruin your vacation <laughs> uh, and, and surprise people at some stage. That could be a tweet, um, I think, going down uh, <laughs> as we speak. Uh, so that certainly is, right, my job is to break news. I'm supposed to go find it and, and report it and, and move markets and uh, tell people things that they don't know. Um, but yes, uh, obviously there's lots of activism. I don't get to write on all of it. Um, and and we, do, we do pick and choose our spots. And, and we do take into consideration, okay, well, what's the, what's the stake? Like, what are they actually, how much money do they actually put in this? How credible are they? Uh, is this the first time they've ever done this? And do they have a track record that we should be giving them what can be the platform of the Wall Street Journal to voice their views? Th those are things we consider. Um, the choice of whether we report on it is always kind of that fact specific and, and, and we'll figure it out. Um, you may not always agree with the choice. Steve, I suspect that almost every situation um, is different, but as a counselor to activists, w when, do you, when do you see them making the call to come out of nowhere as opposed to seek a, uh, a, a more partnership path? Let me just get back to Monster for a second. I didn't yeah. represent media in, in Monster, but I do represent Alden in two situations this year. Um, they invested in Pier 1, uh, bought about 10% of the company, mm -hmm. um, had a, and you talk about a 100-page deck there. Um, putting together a 100-page deck takes a fair amount of work. Um, it, it, it generally requires, you know, a real understanding of the business. It requires generally a, a significant length of time of, of in, in many cases, going out, particularly in retail and, and actually visiting hundreds of stores and speaking to suppliers and customers and um, 
logistics and really understanding the business and sort of what's involved in the business. And it may come as a surprise to you, and I'm also representing Alden in Fred's pharmacy right now, which is also sort of in the news because there's a little transaction with Rite Aid and, and others involved right now. And um, generally, uh, my clients, uh, particularly those that are, that are doing the type of work that needs to be done, are, are looking at things sometimes a year in advance, sometimes six months in advance, and they're really trying to understand the company, they're looking at a situation that is potentially undervalued, but there has to be, in their mind, sort of a path to unlock value. There has to be a price point that it makes sense to invest at. So sometimes they may be looking at a situation for six months or a year and saying, gee, it's not the right time to invest. And then there's an earnings disappointment or some other event occurs that, that allows them to say it's now time to sort of get in the stock. So uh, there's a fair amount of sort of homework that goes into it. And um, in many cases, our clients know the business as well as uh, the executives in, 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 in the company maybe have different views because they're looking at it from the outside without the benefit of the knowledge. But clearly, a, in many cases, a greater knowledge than many members on the board. So um, it's sort of, when it comes out, and it comes out of blue sometimes simply because there's a strategic reason to come out of the blue. Uh, but many, many times there are sort of private discussions, and, and in most situations, there are private discussions that go on behind the scenes, and then there's, you know, sort of a surfacing of, uh, of events. But that usually occurs after the client accumulates a position, because what you don't want to have happen is for David, who's every day looking for the next story, to sort of hear who's accumulating you know, stock in this company, write about it, um, if it's an Elliot, a Starbucks, a Jana, and... David writes a story that they're in the stock, the stock will generally jump 10 to 20% as soon as the story comes out. So from the point of view of, of my clients, they're trying to quietly accumulate a position, then either engage behind the scenes after they've accumulated a position, or in certain situations, go public because there's a business reason to go public. But if I can push back for just a second, yep. your clients have to understand that the shot across the bow is enormously disruptive to business. So beyond uh, the let's get ourselves involved in the future of the business, the makeup of the board, in Mike's case, the disruption of a deal, um, the commercial aspects of the company must go on. And that disruptive factor would lead one to conclude that we're not adding in the near term value to the situation for your clients. What, what, how does that discussion go uh, when, you, when you're sitting with, with a, an activist and saying, okay, let's shake things up a little bit? Just if you can give us any color on that, I think well, it's useful for the audience. You know, uh, there's a concept that activists are generally short-term investors. The larger activists actually have a longer holding period on average than the fidelities and genesis of the world who are generally in funds. So a typical um, significant activist investor is, is prepared to hold a position for two years. In the case of people like Value Act, who are generally viewed as constructive act, it was five years or more. So sometimes short-term disruption is pretty good. The status quo may not be working. You know, sometimes, you know, shock and awe works, and sometimes, you know, conjoling works, but uh, it all depends on the situation. You know, let's assume you know, you reach out to the company and, you know, you have some views about what needs to be done and you feel like you're, you know, you don't have a real active engagement. And yes, you've met with the CEO, but you don't feel your message is being properly conveyed to the board or, you know, you feel you're being ignored. Uh, at that point in time, you sometimes say, let's go to plan B. Yes, there are some activists that, you know, that believe in, you know, uh, I guess third point was one years ago, Dan Loeb, who his letters were famous, and you know, the first thing you heard from him was a letter, but that's really, in my view, 10% you know, of, of the situations. 90% of the situations, there is generally some type of discussion before the activist service. So Mike, you said to me uh, in our prep call, you found your corporate communication staff with due respect, wholly unprepared for what happened, that they were, in your words, really good at the communications component of the commercial side of the business. Um, but as the general counsel sort of in the middle of this, um, when did you understand that you needed real help and, and how would you advise the CCOs in the room about striking the balance between the internal team and experts like Joel uh, 
Frank and, and the, the folks that Barrett works with every day? Well, I think um, in Monster's case, uh, you know, I would say Media News was a shareholder for about 35 days before they launched uh, their attack on the transaction. So it's a little bit different. Uh, that's why everybody was taken, taken off guard. But given the context of a pending acquisition, um, we knew how critical it was to not just fend off um, Media News' attempts, but also we had an acquirer out there um, who was not too happy. <laughs> we had just announced a transaction and all of a sudden um, there's now an attempt to really just get, you know, get, get Ronstadt to increase their offer. Um, we, you know, I view my role, I viewed my role as helping the CCO uh, communicate to the C-suite, but also trying to hold the hands and keep the hysterics to a minimum on the board and the CEO side. Because, you know, aside from being extremely offended by the allegations of incompetence, um, you know, everybody just wants to fight back and, let, oh, we should issue a press release right away and, de you know, debunk everything that they've said. And, um, and you just need somebody on the outside to say, whoa, take, take a step back. Uh, that's not the best way to do this. And, and I found it, it is extremely helpful for, you know, to have an advisor who's been through it before. And um, you know, we, we, we've worked with Joel Frank a very long time. And uh, so they, were, they, knew, they knew Monster's business and they were at the ready. And, they, and they, uh, Andy Rose and Kelly Sullivan gave us extremely um, on point advice, but we also worked with Evercore and their and their um, shareholder activist team, Bill Anderson. Uh, <coughs> so we, we had a team, and and Ronstadt had a team. But you know, to answer your question, yeah, there was just too much at stake. It wasn't your run of the mill activist attack, and we're going to talk, and we'll try to. Fit. This was really going towards. Um, disrupting a transaction that Monster had worked on for very, you know, for years, you could argue, because, it, you know, we were not successful in 2012. So there was a lot at stake, and we just knew that we needed the outside assistance. So, Barrett, the, uh, the old expression, the best defense is a good offense, um, uh, really plays in here in terms of having outside experts. I, I, you folks have often talked about the importance of really good shareholder communications, really, and Mike mentioned that too. We're really being buttoned up with helping your principal shareholders understand company direction and strategy, but that's not often enough in these situations. So what, what are the, the quick two or three lessons for people to be truly prepared to be ready for a situation like this? Um, so Mike hit on one of them. I, I would say that these situations get very personal and heated very quickly. So one litmus test to have in the back of your mind in these fights is that um, if it feels good, it's probably a very bad idea. <laughs> Uh, so keep that going. No fun, Barrett. <laughs> that's a tweet right there. If it feels good, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, th that's <laughs> that goes for various um, areas. The other thing <laughs> I Hashtag page spring. <laughs> Let's be really clear <laughs> what I was talking about. Sorry, Barrett. Go um, ahead. The other thing I would suggest to you is that I've come across some very brilliant board members and executives um, that know the business, but they're not always the best, best spokespeople. And when you're in these situations, you need them uh, on, on point and uh, able to go on the road, speaking not just with the shareholders. Um, you, they need to speak with proxy uh, recommendation firms, ISS. And, um, so having a, an articulate, presentable, and on message executive is very important. And having a, a team around you that is experienced, I think, is important. One thing that I think is very surprising for many companies is that how experienced the advisors on the other side are. Um, in addition to Steve's firm, these activists retain their own PR advisors. They often retain lobbyists. They've got digital ad people. They're developing videos. So they, they themselves are very adept at communications, and it's important, as important for the companies to be adept at communications. It remains surprising to me, just to stay on that point for a second, as, as I meet a lot of corporate communicators, that we don't, as a profession, probably driven by budget realities, amass a cadre of experts like general counsels tend to do. They have outside counsels for corporate governance. They have outside counsel for trial. They have outside counsel um, in, in my world 
for uh, patent litigation. But as corporate communicators, we tend to think we've got a good solid team, we're prepared, and I don't have the budget to keep on these experts. And that, that is certainly something that's been my experience through the years, that a, a big public company needs to have at the ready uh, this kind of help for M&A, for crisis, for litigation, and so forth. Uh, David, I was, I was uh, surprised and almost a little amused uh, as we were getting mic'd up to, to know that you and Barrett and Steve were all in the same place, was it just yesterday? Last week. At, last week at Tulane at a conference around M&A and these topics. You folks are all in this sort of traveling circus of financial crisis <laughs> and activism together. And the reason I, I bring this up is because I, it's always been my core belief that in crisis communications is not the time to meet Wall Street Journal reporters and try to develop a rapport. You want an ongoing relationship ahead of the crisis. Um, I feel like corporate communicators, the people in this room, are at an enormous disadvantage when you call, David, because you know Steve, you know his clients, you probably know the Joel Frank people, but you don't know, typically, these companies as the activist beat reporter. There may be beat reporters elsewhere in the building. How do you deal with the fact that there is no trust relationship between you and that brand new corporate communicator who's been rocked back on their heels? Um, that's a tough one. So I definitely am well aware that I sort of parachute into situations, and that is not easy on anyone, uh, and that sometimes I'm calling in the middle of the night, hopefully not in the middle of the night, uh, but at, at odd hours and saying, hey, listen, you may not know this. I know this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but we're going to have to deal with this. And, and I try to approach it very openly, and, and you know, we have a rule. There are no surprises in the Wall Street Journal. There, you shouldn't ever read something about your company that you haven't heard from a Wall Street Journal reporter about. Um, you also mentioned I have the way the Wall Street Journal is structured. We have corporate beat reporters who cover most of your companies and hopefully are in daily talks with you and your executives. Um, and that's sort of how we work. I do a lot of research on my own. I, I study up on the company, but I also get to call up my wonderful colleagues and say, so uh, there's an activist in this stock. What do you know? What's going on with this company? Let's make sure we have the context of what's been happening with this company, maybe why its stock is underperforming or maybe why it's outperforming and why this activist seems a little off already. Um, and that's sort of how we, we like to do it. But if you're a company that doesn't have a daily relationship with the Wall Street Journal, then you might be getting a out of the blue call from me. Um, and I would say not returning the call is a really bad idea. <laughs> I keep thinking of tweets I'd be sending if I was sitting in the audience. Hey, Barrett, you wanted to make a point. I can see it on your face. Yeah, I mean, look, 90% of the work we do with Benoit and other reporters like him is on background um, as, as a PR outside advisor. Where we partner with our client is on the beat side. And ha you having those relationships is incredibly important to getting that perspective into Dave's story. He's being fed every day by folks like Steve. Steve is an excellent PR person as well as a good lawyer. So, uh, I, and, I, and I know he's dropping <laughs> letters and phone calls in the middle of the night. So the relationship on the corporate side is incredibly important. We, we can background and provide perspective to Dave and, and, and really point out where the activist is wrong or missing, the, missing a point, or frankly, where he's not being constructive, because certainly by the time they're calling Dave, and more often than not, they're not constructive, and there are some cheap shots. Um, and, and that's our job on the PR side, from an agency point of view, is to make sure he's pointing out the cheap shots. Mm -hmm. um, but but ha having the, ba the balance perspective coming in for the beat reporter is essential. But that, and that's something that can be done well in advance and, and supportive of your day-to-day -day anyway. Yes. And, and that point's the same. I think you were bringing this up earlier, right? In, on the investor side too, right? Steve's clients and the activists talk to the same investors on every investment. And that's why they know, the, they know how they're going to operate. And that's, that's the, their like playbook is, OK, well, we, we know how Vanguard and BlackRock and capital research think, whether it's your company or your company or your company. And, that, and that's how it works. Go ahead, Steve. It's a few points. Number one, you know, David usually calls on Sunday night, just so you know. So <laughs> that's the night usually to worry about. Um, you know, when you think about the, the repeat successful activists, they're involved in 40, 50, 60, 100 companies. They've done it many, many times before. They, they're very experienced. When a CCO or a company reacts quickly without advice, we know immediately from what their press release says that they didn't get advice. And 
in, in, in the world we deal in, um, you know, you don't want to make a mistake on our side of the world. You don't want to mis make a mistake on the company side of the world. So I'll tell you that early communications are important. Number two is um, CEOs and boards think that they have great relationships with their shareholders because they may be talking to the portfolio manager at Fidelity or, or BlackRock or Janus, but those aren't the people making the voting decision when you have a proxy contest. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter that you have the greatest relationship in the world with the portfolio manager. That person is not making the voting decision at BlackRock. There's a separate arm at BlackRock that makes a voting decision. There are people that um, have you know, certain views, they will listen and they will talk to a portfolio manager, but they have separate sort of voting decisions. So you really need to understand what is important to them. Um, in many cases, you know, they don't view activism as a bad thing. They view it as, gee, if, you know, if, if, you're, a, uh, if you're an investor because you're, cause you're a, um, BlackRock and you have to be in the, every company in the Russell 2000 and someone shakes up a company you're in, usually good things are going to happen. Um, the company is going to have to react positively in terms of you know, communicating with shareholders. It could have to deal with the issues that the activists present, maybe not the way the activists want to deal with, but have to deal with the issues, have to deal with performance issues, maybe have to refresh their board, uh, maybe have to think about you know, getting rid of an underperforming business, maybe have to think about you know, tying you know, compensation to performance in a different way than they've done. And at the end of the day, those things usually, in the long run, yield to greater value one way or the other. So, uh, it's just a different world that you're dealing with, and you really, on your side of the world, should get the professional's advice. Well, uh, uh, one point uh, on this, because I, I think it's important to preempt the activism ever coming. Months before an activist comes, they've, 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 they've taken the poll. I think where companies often fall down is they're out presenting their, their typical deck. They fail to ask the question to the investor, and what are your thoughts? And it's the dialogue, it's the two-way to pull the information out of the investor that's really important because the investors don't want to give the, the management bad news because they don't want to lose access. So it's incumbent upon the person on the company side to say, and what do you think about this? Where, where are you focused? How, how are you viewing where we're taking the company? To ask the hard, have them tell you, and you have to ask them the hard questions because I can tell you that the activist has done it, and they're giving them the information, so they come armed, and you want to have it before they come to you. I'm just curious. Um, we have quite a group here. Maybe just a quick show of hands among the corporate communications people here. Uh, how many people own the investor relations function or are involved in it? Hands up. And among the corporate communicators here, how many are completely outside the investor relations function? So tough to see in the lights, but it looks like a relatively uh, similar similar group. Mike, you talked about um, you talked a little bit about the surprise and the sort of per personal nature of the attack. What what did it take um, to avoid swinging back, uh, and and how how was that decision made? Um, well, I, I I will tell you that our internal communications folks had a press release ready to go by, by you know, the evening of Friday, August 16th. Um, and it really was, you know, we had, we had benefited because we had just, uh, you know, been through the process of announcing the transaction. So we had advisors around us who um, were there when we said, you know, we have to take a step back and say, we have to be smart about this. As Steve said, you know, they, your activists know when you fire off a, pre, a press release and, you know, it's like, oh, there's fresh meat. They don't have anybody telling them what to do. Um, and that's, that's hard. That's hard as an executive of a company to swallow because you all, you know, we all think we know what's best for, for the company. We all think we know how to deal with things the best way. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, to have the third party outside view helping you um, take a step back, take a deep breath, here, you know, for them to share how they would propose uh, uh, handling it, which is often completely opposite of the way that you were about to go down the road, um, it's a bit shocking, but it also says, wow, we really have to stop because we are moving 
way too fast. I, uh, I want to alert the audience, David, just one second, that we want, to, we want to open the floor up for a couple of quick questions, so be thinking about that. You had a point. I was going to say, we, we welcome and support all shareholder engagement, right? Is that the statement? That's, that's your first statement. I got it for you right there. Yeah. <laughs> you already have that Free. pre-populated yeah, yeah, in your yeah. computer. Yeah, that's already a given. It's a, it's a quick and I'm not going to quote it. But, but, I, but, I, but that, you know, that leads to a question, though, David. That the, there are businesses that you cover where the journal has an extensive beat reporter. Um, the business has been doing well. It's outperformed the Dow for multiple quarters. Leadership is on a plan to reinvent the business. I'll pick an example. Try not to kick me. DuPont is a good example. Um, there was a company moving forward, um, and as a result of what happened, and I'm simplifying a very complicated situation, the CEO's out of the job and DuPont belongs to Dow, and, and, and that story's been written. But as you sit there as a reporter, and I hope there's no DuPont people in here because I might have just gotten in trouble. I, I, as you sit there as a reporter and you look at a company that's successful, clearly you must be thinking very, have a different mindset than when you're looking at a business whose share price has dropped for the last three or four quarters that has missed expectations in the market. How, how does that go into the calculus of how you cover the story? I mean, I think the DuPont situations of the world are far more interesting is what it is. And so I'm more going to dig into it, to be honest with you. Um, I think when... When it's not a clear cut, your company's in trouble and your shareholders clearly aren't happy with you. That's, that's sort of like in a layup in, in a lot of ways. Um, the activist is going to say a few things and you're probably going to settle with them in a month or two and give them a board seat or something. Um, when, it's, when it's sort of unclear and there are, uh, I think Tryon would argue in DuPont that that company was not outperforming. Um, DuPont would definitely argue they are not owned by Dow. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a, I think activism at its best and most interesting is, is, I think Steve was saying this earlier, has sort of shaken the groundwork of um, what investors get to talk about. And it's not just activists, it's, it's all fund managers now want to come in and talk to you about your direction and they want to have views on it. And I, I think at its best, it's a healthy debate. At its worst, it's a bad idea. Um, but that depends on the situation. And I think in DuPont, it was a long relationship there um, that sort of broke down as it went and led to a pretty uh, nasty fight. But so I want to look out at the audience. We have mic runners out there. If you have a question for any of the members of the panel, if you could raise a hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Your chance to ask a Wall Street Journal reporter a tough <laughs> and unexpected question. There are here's, other people. Here's a hand <laughs> up here uh, in the front. Takes a second for the mic runner to get there. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Erin Passanet, Janice, Steve Ona. Thank you for the couple plugs. Um, I'm just curious if you've advised shareholder activists and they've gone in to talk with management, has there ever been a situation where then they back off? Yes, and, and it depends how you find back off um, in, in the sense that we've had clients say, okay, we're going to give you another year. We're, we, we hear what you're saying. Um, you know, we may not agree with you 100%, but, you know, we're going to give you some time to see if you're going to implement your, your plan. Um, I think that constructive engagement is the most important thing. And uh, at least from the point of view of where my clients are coming from, um, when the private communications lead to real discussions, um, you generally have results that are, that, are, that are best for all. I can think of a number of situations. I can think of one for a very large hedge fund last year where they surfaced a month after the annual meeting, couldn't nominate for a year, sat down with the company. I think the market cap of the company was about $20 billion. Um, and within two weeks, uh, had agreed to sort of work behind the scenes. Then the, the, the company said, well, why don't you br add, bring someone to, onto the boardroom? And we had a settlement a month after the annual meeting where, um, and it's worked out very well for everyone. So uh, those are the best situations where you actually don't have to write the public letter. When you're writing the public letter, it usually means that the process is broken down for some reason. So uh, that's what I would tell you. Good question, Thank thanks. You. How about over here? Yeah, Rob Flaherty with Ketchum. Uh, can you describe over the past few years the evolving world of software and platforms and tracking and AI as it relates to anticipating and seeing the swarm of activists around a company? 
I, I can tell you from my perspective, that's something my clients struggle with quite a bit. Um, they hire stock surveillance firms, they hire proxy solicitor firms to do a stock watch um, to see where, sh where uh, shares are trading. And it's, I would say, more art than science. Um, a lot of these trades are being made in derivatives on purpose. So they don't really know until they're ready to be shown, as Steve has rightly pointed out. Um, there's, uh, I guess, financial operational governance screens that many companies do. Um, we, we can do them from PR perspective. I'm sure you all could as well, just looking at what is considered best practice and what's relative performance within your peer group uh, and doing a compare there. Um, so there's, I guess, metrics that you can look at, but as far as monitoring who's coming in and out of the shareholder base, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a challenge. And just to understand, just touching on derivatives, um, there's, there's a Hart Scott Rodino is an antitrust act, which you think applies to mergers of competing companies, but also applies to acquisitions of stock in, in public companies by, by funds that are taking an active position. And the threshold's about uh, $80.8 million in terms of common stock. So if you're looking at a company that has a, a market cap of $20 billion, and you know, you're looking to establish uh, a 5% position, that's a uh, that's billion dollars. You can't do it in common stock without filing for HSR. And if you file for HSR, even though it's not a public filing, the company gets notice of it immediately. So it's really not a smart way to go if you're trying to quietly accumulate a position to give the company notice, hey, we want to acquire a billion dollars worth of stock in the next you know, 60 days. So derivatives are used, um, and derivatives are not subject to Hart Scott Rodino limitations. So, it's the other side is always looking at it, but it's but it's hard to figure out. And you can acquire a billion dollars of economic interest in a in a company in a uh, very quick period of time. Remember, you don't need to vote securities until there's a record date for an annual meeting. So if you're acquiring a position in February and the annual meeting's in June and the record date's in uh, beginning of May, you can file for your HSR, which is a 30-day process, at the end of March and still be able to vote the shares in May and turn that derivative position into actual ownership. So it's, uh, it's something that is hard from the other side to figure out, but they're trying to do it every day. I would suggest to uh, beyond the stock surveillance, uh, beyond the peer performance metrics and the governance, in most cases, there's an undercurrent of unrest within, this, within the shareholder base um, by the time an activist comes on the scene. So th there's more questions around um, capital allocation. There's more scrutiny around operational changes that, that could be made or should be made in the shareholder mind. You may be seeing commentary and sell-side analyst reports that's a little different from what it has been in the past. Um, so, and if you are on the other side of the table and you ask the question and don't just present your argument, you're likely to hear things that would trigger or would give you reason to believe an activist may be on the horizon. But it's important to ask the question and keep the ear open because I think we also self-censor ourselves as to what we're willing to hear. Excellent points. Mike, can you speak as we start to wrap up uh, our panel session this afternoon, speak about the relationship between the general counsel's office and the corporate communications office and why that's so important in this scenario? Uh, you have to be a team. You know, it's uh, unfortunately, as much as the general counsel is the, often the brunt of uh, hostility or uh, anger coming from the CEO, uh, I've been in so many situations where the chief communications officer is getting it worse than I am. Um, <laughs> from both sides. From both sides. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a, a, they, they never win. Um, so, you know, it's really a, a team effort. And like I, as I said earlier, you know, I viewed my role as kind of helping the, the CCO and our outside advisors effectively communicate and effectively get the message to the CEO and the board on what we really needed to do. And to really, um, because, I, because I had the relationship with the board, I was able to um, you know, move things along and, and to make it a little bit easier for, for, for the advisors and for our internal comms team to really be effective. Because otherwise, it's, it's, it's just more battles internally that you don't deal with. 
Steve, the, uh, there, there's a new piece of research coming out from uh, the Arthur Page Society, this group, about what CEOs are thinking about, and, and corporate reputation, brand, company messaging is, is important to them. From the activist perspective, uh, and I can almost guess your answer, but I want to hear it, I, how do activists take in uh, the, the corporate narrative, the company's positioning, its uh, social activism, is any of that matter, or is this a pure economic play? No, all of it matters because it, it matters to your shareholder base. Um, so economics always drives the bus, but you know, um, inclusiveness is a, is a big issue in this day and age. Um, you know, being sensitive to environmental issues is important. Corporate governance issues are important to certain shareholder bases. And you know, your uh, most proxy contests that go to a vote, the difference in vote is usually between two and four percent of the outstanding shares. It's very unusual to have landslides one way or the other. So every shareholder vote is important and, and the shareholder base is important. And you, you can't afford to lose a shareholder because you're ignoring a corporate governance issue. Thanks. I, I want to ask one last question and then we need to wrap up so that we can keep the, the event on schedule. David, I want to come back to where we started. Um, from your perspective, if the market has shifted from at least in some circumstances, to more constructive engagement. Um, as someone who follows this topic very closely every day, and I now know I never want to get a Sunday evening phone call from you, uh, where are we going to be in three years from now? What does shareholder activism look like three years down the road? Um, so my view on this is there's sort of going to be a bifurcation, right? There, there are the 10 to 12 big funds that are probably still going to be around. Yes, there's a couple that have had some rough patches who have to prove that they'll be around um, that will move more towards constructivism, right? They'll, they'll call up and they're not gonna fire off a letter first. You're gonna be in with CEOs and stuff and maybe that breaks down and maybe then it gets heated but largely that won't be the way it'll go. And then there will be kind of a smaller set of uh, funds that target sort of sub $2 billion companies, let's say, um, that things will be a little bit more uh, Wild West out there. And there's a little more freedom for them to, to kind of fire off things, and I think we'll still see that. Um, and then I, I think the other thing that's really important to the activism is actually the indexing trend in that how much money is pouring into index funds, which sit in the top five of all the holders. and can't say things about you know, capital returns and return on investments that aren't focused on that because they just can't staff that way. Mm -hmm. And the actively managed funds who are increasingly realizing if we're going to beat those index funds, we need to speak up about these things that we care about. And I think that's what we're going to see. Well, I would tell you, David, um, Barrett, Mike, and Steve, the the page organization operates against a, sense, a set of principles, and, and among them are uh, for all of us to always be truth tellers, but the most important of which is to conduct our business as if the company literally depends on it. And this topic, and I know this from hearing from fellow page members over the last few days, this is a topic for all of us where the company's future really does depend on it. It's true to the page principles, so we're most grateful for you to represent the various stakeholder audiences that are involved in this process. Your advice and the lessons learned are meaningful to our event. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you very much.